Welcome back to Sugar Metabolism on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, in this video, we're going to discuss the entner deuteroff pathway. Now, in the vast majority of eukaryotic organisms, the default pathway for sugar metabolism, as in glucose metabolism, is glycolysis. In fact, any biochemistry course that you take, um, probably the first metabolic pathway you're going to look at is glycolysis. And in prokaryotes, the type of sugar metabolism actually varies. A lot of bacteria actually do possess the glycolytic pathway and the enzymes in it, but there's actually some bacteria that actually have an alternate pathway for deriving energy from glucose, and it's the entner deuteroff pathway. Now, the entner deuteroff pathway is really just a mixture of two pathways. So this first part of the entner deuteroff pathway is really just the oxidative hexose monophosphate shunt or it's the oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway, which you may or may not have covered in your biochemistry course, but it's one uh, pathway that's used to produce NADPH from glucose, ultimately. So the first half of this actually is literally the oxidative pentose phosphate pathway. And then when I flip to the next slide, and I'm not actually going to do this in this video, but when we flip to the next slide and we go over the last half of this pathway, it's really just the last half of glycolysis. So it's kind of a mixture of the two pathways. Okay, so let's go into it. First of all, we start with glucose, that's our sugar, our primary sugar that we're going to metabolize, and hexokinase, which is actually common in glycolysis, is going to phosphorylate the sixth position on glucose right here uh, using ATP, and we're going to generate glucose 6 phosphate. All right, that's pretty predictable, and we're pretty much now going to start the oxidative pentose phosphate pathway. So, glucose 6 phosphate is going to be oxidized by this enzyme, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase. What this enzyme does is it uses the oxidizing power of NADP, and it takes this hydroxyl group on the one position right here where my mouse is, this hydroxyl group, and converts it into a carbonyl. So it takes it up one oxidation state. Notice in this reaction, first of all, we get this molecule, which is 6-phosphogluconolactone, but also we get an NADPH. So this is actually one method that the bacteria can use to generate NADPH, which is often used in biosynthetic reactions. All right, so what happens next? Well, this, uh, this ester, really, is going to be hydrolyzed by phosphogluconolactonase, which basically uses water to hydrolyze this ester bond right here. And we ultimately get this molecule, 6-phosphogluconate. Well, 6-phosphogluconate is going to be dehydrated by 6-phosphogluconate dehydratase. Now, what this enzyme does is it takes this hydroxyl group right here, which is now at the 2 position, and it's going to, first of all, convert that into a carbonyl, as you see over here. But also at the 3 position, this hydroxyl group is effectively removed. You can see it gone right here in the product of this enzyme, which its full name is 2-keto-3-deoxy-6-phosphogluconate, which we typically just abbreviate as KDPG, KDPG. It's a lot easier than saying that full name. Now, this next enzyme is going to be different from glycolysis and the uh, oxidative pentose phosphate pathway. It's not common to either of these. It's kind of a unique enzyme, but it's used to sort of bridge the two halves together. So KDPG is going to be split apart by KDPG aldolase. And so what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to take this six carbon sugar, it's no longer cyclic, but it's still six carbons, and it's going to break it into two three carbon fragments. One of the fragments that comes off is simply pyruvate. And we all know what pyruvate is. It's the product of glycolysis, the entire pathway. And we know that pyruvate can actually be oxidized further into acetyl-CoA. Okay? But KD PG aldolase also produces glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now, if you've done any study of glycolysis in any organism, you would know that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P, is one of the intermediates in glycolysis. Now, rather than doing this in a separate video, let me actually just go to the next slide where we'll have all the rest of this information. Because now that we've hit an intermediate in glycolysis, G3P, or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we can now begin the last half of this pathway, which is just the last half of glycolysis. I think you'll see that it's identical. So glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is going to be converted to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And again, this is catalyzed by the enzyme glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Notice that the oxidation 
is going to use NAD and we get out NADH and also notice we put a phosphate here on the one position oxygen here on this carboxyl. Okay, so we now have a phosphate linkage right here and we're going to use that to transfer that phosphate to ADP to generate ATP, which is our first example here of substrate level phosphorylation. 1,3-BPG or 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is going to be converted to 3-phosphoglycerate by phosphoglycerate kinase. So kinase because it's transferring this phosphate over here on the one position to ADP to generate ATP. And that gives us 3-phosphoglycerate. Well then hopefully we remember that 3-phosphoglycerate is going to be isomerized into its constitutional isomer by phosphoglycerate mutase, which generates 2-phosphoglycerate. Notice what's happening. The phosphate over here on the 3 position is being moved or translocated to the 2 position, as you see here on the product, 2-phosphoglycerate. Okay? Now, 2-phosphoglycerate is going to be uh, dehydrated by enolase. So enolase is going to remove this hydroxyl group and form a double bond. It's essentially an elimination reaction. So water goes away, and from enolase we generate phosphoenolpyruvate, which is probably our highest energy metabolite in glycolysis. And then phosphoenolpyruvate can be converted to pyruvate by pyruvate kinase, which takes this phosphate from the phosphoenolpyruvate and puts it on ADP to make ATP. All right, and that's catalyzed again by pyruvate kinase. Now, one important thing to do with the entner deuteroff pathway is to sort of contrast it with glycolysis. All right, so let's think about glycolysis. What are the net outputs of glycolysis? Well, we know that we get two molecules of pyruvate per glucose. Per glucose, we also get two NADHs and we also get two ATPs, at least net. All right, so let's look at this entire pathway and see what we get. All right. Well, first of all, in the reaction of hexokinase, notice we had to burn one ATP, so we have a loss there, but we actually make up for it because we make one ATP here in phosphoglycerate kinase, and we make up another one in pyruvate kinase. So if we have to lose one of them, we gain two back. So we actually, in the entner deuteroff pathway, we lose out on one net ATP, but we still get one. So one ATP per glucose we still get two molecules of pyruvate. So that's actually common between glycolysis and the entner deuteroff pathway. What about NADH? Well, we actually only are gonna get one NADH, and that's through the action of glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Now, in glycolysis, this reaction is going to occur twice, right? But we're only getting one G3P, so all this is occurring one time. So therefore, we get one NADH. But here's the kicker. We actually get out an NADPH. So the difference between the entner deuteroff pathway and glycolysis, other than the fact that we're shortchanged 1ATP here and 1NADH, is that we actually can get NADPH. And remember that NADPH is different in function than NADH because NADH is typically used to power the respiratory chain. Um, typically for aerobic organisms, they use NADH to power some aspect of their electron transport chain. Bacteria have those as well. But NADPH is used in biosynthetic reactions, many um, anabolic reactions to make larger molecules from simple molecules. And so glycolysis doesn't give us NA, any NADPH. So this is actually a way we can combine the two pathways. We still get an NADH, we still get an ATP, two pyruvates, but we also get NADPH, okay? So hopefully this makes a little bit of sense, and hopefully you see how the pathway works and how it contrasts with glycolysis, all right? So please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.